When I tell people I work with professional athletes, they often think I'm talking about Michael Jordan or LeBron James. But really, I'm talking about working on racehorses that run at average speeds of 37 miles per hour. That's 10 miles per hour faster than the fastest human ever. Or working on eventing and show jumping horses that leap over fences that are more than five feet high on a tightly timed course. Or working on dressage horses, which are sometimes referred to as dancing horses on social media because of the precise movements they perform in a seemingly effortless manner in complete harmony with the rider. Just like human athletes have trainers, nutritionists, orthopedic surgeons, and physical therapists, so too do horse athletes. It's my job to keep horses safe and healthy as they perform these incredible feats so that they live long and happy lives. Today, we're going to focus on one place where human and horse athletes differ, and that's this. Take a look at the human leg on the left. Compare it to this horse leg on the right. What do you notice? Well, the hoof, obviously. But look at that distribution of muscle. Even humans with an incredibly low BMI have a lot of padding around their joints and bones, made up of muscle and fat underneath the skin. Horses, on the other hand, have shockingly skinny lower legs. There's just not much protecting their joints, and it turns out that's a big problem for them. So my question as a horse orthopedic surgeon is how can we better protect horse legs so we have happy, healthy horse athletes? I got into this work because I love horses, and all animals for that matter. I grew up with many family pets in New York and also watching horse racing and riding hunter jumpers. My hunter jumper thoroughbred mare, Nails, who I've had for almost 20 years, is retired now, but without a doubt living her best life with our donkey, Henry. They are truly best friends and partners in crime around the farm. Currently, I ride dressage with an awesome Lusitano gelding named Gotago, or more appropriately, Gogo, since his little engines are always on. He is the bravest and most trustworthy horse I've ever ridden, and I'm so excited to keep learning dressage with him. And last, but certainly not least, are my two German short hair pointers, Paxton and True, who are my buddies for every outdoor activity that doesn't involve horses, and the best very large lap dogs. Like many of my colleagues, I always knew I wanted to be a vet. I worked for a family friend who is a small animal veterinarian on Long Island since I was very young, and he is still a major role model and mentor for me. When I got to vet school at Cornell, though, I realized I was much happier out in a barn working on horses than working with small animals. I also really fell in love with surgery, the satisfaction of fixing something, and all the technical hand skills that involves. After graduating from vet school, I was fortunate to get an internship at Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, one of the most famous racehorse hospitals. It was a crash course in high-level horse care at an electric pace with exceptionally talented equine veterinarians. After my internship at Rudin Riddle, I returned to Cornell, working with amazing surgeons there for both my surgical residency and my PhD. During that time, I also got to work with several human orthopedic surgeons on projects alongside my mentor, Dr. Lisa Fortier. There is a huge overlap between human orthopedics and horse orthopedics. But horses are tricky. They're just so big. You can't just have them lay in a hospital bed to take weight off of a leg. If they have a joint problem, that joint is under a tremendous amount of weight and pressure. This is why there are no true joint replacements for horses like there are for humans and dogs. Also, a horse can't tell you what hurts. You have to be incredibly observant, watching the horse under different circumstances to see what's really going on. But we do use a lot of the same protocols in horses as in humans, a lot of the same medicine, and also a lot of the same rehabilitation or physical therapy. Part of the reason I'm so excited about the work I do is that horse medicine can not only benefit horses, but humans too. Today, I work at a veterinary teaching hospital in North Carolina, NC State University. What's exciting about that is that we often get really difficult cases, cases that other vets are having trouble with, and so they refer them to us. North Carolina is a huge horse state and is a mecca for venting and other disciplines like show jumping and dressage. This means we get to be on the leading edge of horse research and care. 
NC State had several clients complete it, compete at the Olympics this past summer. And by clients, I mean both the horse and their rider. And yes, flying a horse to Tokyo is just as difficult as it sounds. What's really interesting about horse athletes is that, like human athletes, horses have a team around them. Owners, investors, trainers, riders, and their veterinary team. Horses are big investments, both emotionally and financially. If you qualify for a competition, and even the Olympics, you qualify specifically with a horse. It's a true partnership and also very high stakes. Most horses are insured for large amounts of money for this reason. Also interesting is that many horses have multiple careers. Racehorses train as two-year-olds and then have their peak racing years as three and four-year-olds. But a horse will often live for up to 30 years. So many racehorses will have a second career as a sport horse, doing something like eventing, show jumping, or another discipline. Different athletic endeavors require different kinds of care. That brings me back to horse legs. Because they have so little protection on their legs, horses are very prone to injury. Humans are affected by multiple different kinds of arthritis. You probably know someone who has arthritis, or maybe it's you. The two most common types of arthritis in people are osteoarthritis, typically seen in adults, where the cartilage in the joint degrades from overuse or from a trauma like a torn ACL, or rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune disease where immune system attacks your own body, specifically your joints, like your knees and hips. But horses are affected by another type of arthritis, less commonly seen in humans, called infectious arthritis. Infectious arthritis occurs when bacteria enter the joint and start growing there. This most often occurs when a horse gets a wound on their leg that is open into the joint. Again, this is because horse legs are so unprotected. Infectious arthritis very rarely happens in humans unless they get an infection from a joint replacement surgery. Similarly, but less common than with wounds, horses can also get in joint infections following a joint surgery or a joint injection. So, the question is, how can we protect horses from infectious arthritis? First, we had to figure out how the bacteria function in a joint infection. Surprisingly, there was not a lot of research on this. All right, let's look at a joint. You have bone, cartilage covering the ends of the bone and acting as a cushion, and then the synovial lining of the joint. This synovial lining makes the joint fluid, which works like a lubricant, so your joints move smoothly. Whether you're a horse or a human, there are two reasons why joints are so vulnerable to infections. Problem number one is that your joints are low oxygen, low glucose environments. What does that mean? Well, don't worry if you haven't taken biology for a while. I'll make it simple. Many bacteria eat glucose to survive. Most antibiotics work while bacteria are eating and digesting this glucose. It's kind of like Disney's Snow White. We poison the apple, she eats the apple, she dies. But if she refuses to eat the apple or doesn't eat apples to begin with, our poison won't work. Antibiotics that work great in other parts of the body just don't work as well in a joint because the bacteria aren't on the same diet. Problem number two, is that inside a joint, bacteria easily build into biofilms, which are basically a big sticky blob of bacteria that sticks to surfaces like bone or implants. The reason why biofilms are such a problem is that it's really hard for both immune cells and antibiotics to break through their walls. It's like one of those big battle scenes in Game of Thrones. Your immune system knows there's a problem. They send all their people to the castle walls, but they can't get inside to kill the bad guys. They don't even know what type of bad guys are inside. It's hard to tell because they're inside the biofilm. So we really have a double whammy. Our immune system can't do its job and the antibiotics can't do their job. So the bacteria continue to grow and damage the cartilage and the synovial lining of the joint. The standard treatment is flushing out the infected joint. We do surgery, remove as much of the joint lining as possible, and flush the heck out of the joint. We're talking 10 to 20 liters of saline at a time. Sometimes we'll put antibiotics right into the joint or in a vein next to the joint as well. Still though, for the reasons we just discussed, it doesn't always work very well. And that's really bad because like I said earlier, you can't just put a horse in a hospital bed for months on end. 
If you can't resolve a joint infection, there's unfortunately a large chance that the horse won't survive. And even if they do survive, the horse may be unable to walk or run comfortably because there's so much damage to the joint. All right, so we can't break through the castle walls. The poison apple approach isn't working. Horses are dying. What do we do? We need a new way to kill these bacteria. I was incredibly fortunate to be approached by a veterinarian, Dr. Jess Gilberti, who is working at the University of Pennsylvania New Bolton Center with equine surgeon and researcher, Dr. Tom Scher. Jess wanted to do a PhD with me continuing her work on the use of platelet-rich plasma for joint infections. Jess realized that horses that had their joints treated with platelet-rich plasma for traditional arthritis had very low infection rates. Why? That is what Jess, Tom, and I, along with many other collaborators, have since worked to find out. It turns out that platelets have these teeny tiny antimicrobial peptides, or AMPs, inside that are so small that they can easily bore inside a biofilm. They can get through the castle walls undetected. Plus, AMPs can kill bacteria without the bacteria having to eat them. So, can we use these AMPs in a joint to treat infections? The answer is yes. We first screened all our donor horses for diseases to make sure they were healthy and then took blood samples from them to concentrate their platelets. This is nearly painless for the horse, by the way. It's just like getting a blood draw at the nurse's office, annoying, but not invasive or dangerous. Then we went to the lab to try to figure out which platelet samples work best in joint infections. We partnered up with our colleagues in the chemical engineering department to most effectively make platelet-rich plasma lysate to isolate those antimicrobial peptides or AMPs. After three years in the lab, testing different combination of AMPs, we had a very good idea of which ones work best. We call this peptide cocktail BioPly for the bioactive fraction of platelet-rich plasma lysate. <laughs> That's a mouthful, I know. But this point is very important. We never want to test something in a live animal that hasn't first been proven in the lab. That's why we spent three years testing our options and proving that BioPly worked before we ever even considered treating a live horse with it. After three years, when we were really, really sure it would work, we started offering it to our clients as an option for their horses with joint infections. So here's how it works. This is a horse pre-surgery with a wound that is infected and draining pus. Look how swollen the hock joint is. The hock is the horse equivalent of an ankle. I'm not sure why they have different names for everything. It's very confusing. But anyway, you're looking at a swollen, infected horse hock. We anesthetize the horse for surgery just like normal and flush the joint thoroughly from all aspects. We then help the horse recover from general anesthesia. The day after surgery, the hock is definitely a little bit better, but still massively swollen. Then we start treating it with BioPly. And now look, at four days after surgery, the hawk looks almost normal. And our horses who have been treated with BioPly are much less painful postoperatively than the horses who didn't get the treatment. They also have been able to go back to work and compete successfully. This research is still very much a work in progress, but we've made some incredible breakthroughs. Right now, we still have to make BioPly by hand. It's a very time-consuming and expensive process. In the future, we hope to have a fully synthetic, lab-made version of the treatment that can be made in large batches by engineers and used to treat joint infections anywhere worldwide. As a horse lover, I'm so excited to watch these horse athletes not only survive an injury, but go on to have full careers afterwards. Thank you so much for your interest in my research. Our horse athletes are amazing, and I am honored to take care of them and help them live long, healthy, and happy lives.